Yeah. Um, there's also a tip for the, for the good question. Uh, the brother asked regarding Surah 5, verse 66, which asked the Jews and the Christians to judge by the Torah and the Injil. And as we know okay. today, the Torah and the Injil have not been preserved perfectly, and there are remnants of falsehood in it, just as there are remnants of truth in it. And when the Quran asked the Jews and the Christians to judge by it and to follow it, how could they do that when it, had, when it contains a mix of truth and falsehood? And this is a good question. And uh, approximately 10 years ago, I dedicated a lot of time studying this subject itself. And if you go to my website, wwwcall 2 monotheismcom I have an entire section called Does Islam Endorse the Bible? Where this, where this topic is discussed at length. In short, the Quran has come to tell the Jews and the Christians that their books have been corrupted. You can refer to Surah 2, Ayah 79, and other passages in the Quran which make that clear. And the Quran has made it clear that it is a muhaymin, in Surah 5, verse 48, over the previous scriptures. And that has come to confirm that which is true and expose that which is false from their scriptures. And the Quran is basically telling the Jews and the Christians that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been prophesied in their scriptures, and remnants of those prophecies are still there today. And it's asking the Jews and the Christians to go back to their scriptures, read it again, and reflect over those passages, and come to the realization that they are prophesying the coming of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and to eventually come and accept Islam. Brothers, uh, so there's one brother who I would recommend that you go on YouTube and check out his debates. His name is Brother Zakir Hussein. And this brother, mashallah, has done a lot of good work in this area of the prophet, the prophesizing of Muhammad, peace be upon him, in, in, uh, in, in the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians. And he's come up with new findings and new research on this topic. And he's also doing a good job refuting the arguments of those who are trying to refute uh, those prophecies. So I would recommend that you uh, check out that brother's work on YouTube, inshallah. Yes. I'd like to also add a little bit of, uh, kind of my two cents here. Number one, if you actually study the Bible and actually read the different books within the, uh, the New Testament, you're gonna see that the, the hard uh, facts are actually there. Like for example, if you're going to search for any explicit verse that talks about Trinity, you're not going to find one. Okay? So that's what the, the Quran is basically pointing at. Even though there is alteration, there is basically things that are subtracted, added, and so forth, uh, what would happen is that when you, when you find two things contradictory, if after research, you're going to find that uh, the alteration will be in your face. For example, there is one verse that used to be in the, uh, it's still actually in the King James uh, Bible. It's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Epsilon John, the second, uh, second uh, book. Uh, it's talking about Trinity. Right now, basically, there is proofs by the biblical scholars uh, that this is uh, an insertion. You understand? So you, you, you found this verse, basically, which talks about Trinity. And in many other verses in the Bible, it says, basically, God is one, worship God alone. Like Jesus, Ali, said in the, in the, uh, to the, to the, to the Israel, or the children of Israel. You know, uh, worship God and God is one. This is this is a verse from the New Testament. So you find that verse, you find the other verse, and you basically after real research, you're gonna find that this is an insertion, this is problematic, and this is the proper truth. Another thing, basically, there's so many uh, different cases uh, in the Bible that basically show the truth. Whether it's uh, things about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or the uh, or a forthcoming prophet is gonna basically talk about you know worshiping God from from Arabia and so forth. Uh, one uh, example I'd like to mention, because this is a, a study that I've done, on the book of Daniels. If you, if, you, if you read the book of Daniels, chapter number two, it talks about basically the dream that uh, the king of, of, of uh, Mesopotamia has, uh, which uh, Daniel basically, at least within the New Testament, uh, is, is a prophet. And he interprets the dream, and it talks about basically, you go through literally uh, the historical phases of Persia, uh, Babylonia, uh, Greece, or sorry, Macedonia, and uh, Rome, and then post Rome, which is the Islamic uh, Caliphate. Talk about all of them. 
I'm talking about basically the first four being polytheistic and the fifth one, which is going to basically take over the Roman Byzantine Empire to be the one to upon, uh, basically it's described in the Bible as the kingdom of God, which is really what the Caliphate is really, taking over the Roman uh, Empire. So there's, there's many things that are, are cut and clear and are already in the Bible up to this uh, second. The last one I'd like to make is many people, for some reason, many Muslims think that between the Prophet Sallallahu times and now, that's where the corruption happened. And that's too, totally wrong. Uh, most of the corruption happened before the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu So whatever was there at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu is really mostly what we have today. Or if there is alteration, which I'm, I'm assuming there would be, if you compare them relatively to what's before the Rasulullah Sallallahu and after, they're negligible. Because most of the basic alteration happens when they were making the books and accepting the, the poor canonical uh, Greek Bible uh, and, and then throwing the, the, the rest. So as you can see, this topic is it's actually not as complicated as, as you think, but you just need to basically be familiar with the New Testament yourself and the Old Testament to understand why would Islam go and challenge them to go and apply what's there even though it is altered. You understand the, the, the point here? Very funny. Uh, that's a very does it work? Uh, thank you for the question brother the, uh, the brother asked when it comes to delivering the message of Islam is it enough to just deliver the message of Tawheed itself or what happens in the case that someone may have communicated the message of Tawheed perfectly to that individual but also miscommunicated something to that individual that may have caused him some doubts or made him hesitant to accept Islam. When it comes to the topic of Ahl al-Fatra, um, I'm surprised that I haven't found a lot of books written on this subject. Uh, I, 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 in preparation for my talk, I, I read two quite, uh, quite extensively researched books uh, on the subject in preparation. And I've listened to a number of lectures and, and referred to some of the statements of the scholars on this. When it comes to these details that, you, that, you're, that, we're, that you want to get down into, it becomes quite subjective. Some scholars would say uh, that if the person has a valid shubha or a valid doubt about Islam, and he put the sincere effort into searching for an answer against that shubha and he couldn't find the answer to it, then it would uh, count as an excuse for him for rejecting Islam. As long as he was sincere and he put all his effort, given his circumstances, to seek the correct answer to that doubt. And that doubt must have been a valid doubt, a factual doubt, maybe a contradiction in the Qur'an or a historical error in the Qur'an. Not someone who says, I don't like the idea of hijab. That's not a doubt. That's not a valid doubt. That's you following your desires. So it depends on what kind of doubt the person has. Uh, but to be very honest with you, I don't think you will find a consensus of scholars on these very detailed questions. The main point I wanted to drive forward when I spoke about Ahl al-Fatra was this is that Islam is not being simplistic in saying 
either Islam or hell. No, there are nuances that we need to take into consideration. Islam is fair. It's taking into consideration the age of the person, the mental capacity of the person, the circumstances of the person, the efforts of the person in seeking the truth, the care of the person. Is he an apatheist who is indifferent to searching for the truth, or is he sincerely seeking the truth and Allah knows best, given his ability, whether he exerted the right amount of effort to try to seek the truth, but he fell short. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would know, maybe if I granted this person another 10 years to live, he would have eventually become Muslim. But I took his life uh, before that. That might count as an excuse for him. It's very hard to narrow down and document exactly what are the valid excuses that Allah may uh, take into consideration for every given person? Because we don't have these revealed to us. What we do is that we look at the spirit of the whole thing and come to the realization that Islam, at the end of the day, says that everyone will be judged fairly, according to their mental capacity, according to their efforts, according to their circumstances. To dive in any deeper, well, what if someone had this argument but he couldn't find the answer to it? I don't know. Uh, it, it's not my place to say that I know. I don't know, to be honest with you. So uh, that's all I could say. I guess uh, he hit the nail on the head basically when the son said that uh, if you have a shubha, it is duty upon you to actually go and research it. And if there is, for some reason, you do reach actually an inconclusive uh, evidence about the truthfulness of Islam, I personally would say basically to this possibility is only a logical possibility. You know what's a logical possibility? Logical possibility is in the, within the mind, it is possible. If you make a matrix, it is possible. It is possible in reality. Uh, I'm not sure, especially in today's world. Meaning a person can get a copy of the Quran, read it, and understand that this is the word of God. So what is the, 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 the point I'd like to add here? This was just a reaffirmation of Islam. The only point I'd like to add is basically, what is the bare minimum? What is it needed? I mean, most people come and ask me, Sheikh, so what, what is it needed basically for a person to, uh, for, for me to say a person got the message? And it's very simple, okay? It's very simple. Any person who hears about there is a theme called Islam, which talks about basically there's a one creator for the universe, and that this creator has sent us uh, a Quran, a book, so we live by, through a man who is a messenger called Muhammad Hazdina, sallallahu alaihi That's it. Just those three simple points, I, as, as I just stated them, is enough for him to, uh, this is against him, as an excuse against him, in the day of judgment. Because we have heard that there is something called a creator, and there is something called the Quran, the word of God, guidance, a message from God. And there is someone who delivered this message to the human being, who is a human being himself, a human message. That is it. All right? Now, if, 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 he's, if he's doubtful about any of this information, because the fitra of the person, of the human being, will reaffirm it, will prove it. If he gets any doubts, whether from a human being, or from the shaitan, or from his evil self, it is upon him the duty to go and find the answers. And the minute he does basically search for the answer, the Rasulullah told us, تركتكم على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك Meaning I've left you with the truth so clear, it's as if basically it's a, it's a way, it's a road in the middle of the day. Nobody will miss the road. Except a halik, meaning a, a doomed person, a person who's going to hellfire, a person who's rejecting the road, rejecting the path, Rejecting the truth because it's, it's, it's glaring, it's vivid. So this is how we can basically understand it. Otherwise, without defining what is it needed for a person to know, then Ahlul Fatra, the, the, the definition of Ahlul becomes very malleable, and we fall into the problems that Hassan basically right now uh, came and, and refuted, and Allah Sallam took all the effort to do this. This is the biggest issue of Ahlul Fatra, is defining what it constitutes a person to fall in it and to not be out, to, and to be outside it. And this is the straight answer about this. Wallahu uh,
a loud voice? It's barely working. Shall I can close it? First of all, to talk about the work of you for the informant for the seminar. I really enjoyed it. Um, however, I don't have a question. I have more of a comment mm -hmm. uh, for uh, Shifusta, and it's more of a critique. Okay. Um, so forgive me. That's fine. Uh, about your presentation. Yeah. Um, your analysis I found to be quite narrow because okay. it was called history of Orientalism. Yeah. And you jump straight into the effects it had on Islam. Um, what you mentioned, you, uh, you said that it's an offshoot of uh, the Crusades and colonialism, which is correct, obviously. Mm -hmm. But then when you came to examples like uh, Egypt, um, and you mentioned uh, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, Muhammad Abdul, these are the type of people that Lord Cromer, who was the manager in Egypt, uh, mentioned um, in his book as the Orients themselves. So they were subjects of Orientalism. They were not the perpetrators. I, I hope you, you understand what I'm saying. I explain that a little more. So the subjects of Orient uh, Orientalism, I mean, uh, they were successfully brainwashed by the British colonials, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at is um, you didn't present the, the bare bones of Orientalism. Yeah. You jumped in right into how it affects Islam, when in fact Orientalism is a methodology slash philosophy on its own. It has bare bones, and Muslims are- Ph Philosophy in. about what? Philosophy, well, what, what is the philosophy? Define it for me. It's more of a methodology. Now, I'm welcoming the criticism. I just want to understand what you're saying before you, before you leave, right? I'm not going to see you again. So what is, when you say Orientalism, what do you mean by it? Well, what I mean is uh, uh, Edward Said wrote a book what he said was that Orientalism is uh, basically it's knowledge, right, about um, a geographical region or a culture, but it's based on a platform of ethnocentrism. So basically, Lord Cromer, for example, because you mentioned Egypt, he he wrote a book about the Egyptians, about the Arabs, in which he describes them not as uh, bar you know uh, barbarians or something, mm -hmm. but it's, there's just this, uh, this rhetoric of we and the other, yeah. right? There's the we and the other. Sure. So, uh, what I feel is that Orientalism didn't start off exclusively about Islam because many other cultures have been the uh, victims of Orientalism also. Mm -hmm. Islam and Muslims happen to be the biggest victims, I agree. Sure. But, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, if we want to refute Orientalism on an intellectual level, I think it's important to sort of start with the, the bare bones of it. Because it didn't affect only Muslims. So what is, it, what is it bare bones? When you say bare bones, what does that mean? Well, what I mean is that it didn't affect Muslims only. What did it affect? All the, uh, the, the, the Asian uh, countries, the yeah. African countries, they were all subjects of, of Orientalism. Yeah. Um, Are you comparing basically what the Asians were subjugated to to the Muslim Ummah for the last 800 years? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Are you comparing what the Asian countries have went through and comparing it to what the Ummah of Islam has went through the last 800 years at the hands of the, uh, uh, the Europeans? I'm not denying that at all. Uh, okay, so let's, let me ask you a question. Talk about the criticism. And yeah. um, your comment is actually not in place. Number one, relying upon Edward Said's book is incorrect in itself because he is not Muslim, so he's actually considered an Orientalist from one perspective. Okay? I agree. I agree. Number two, when I discussed basically Jamal al-Din al-Ghani and Muhammad Abdul, I wasn't discussing Orientalism, meaning the source. I was discussing basically the effects of the Orientalism on the Muslim mind. And I was trying to show how did the Orientalist uh, understanding trickle down into the ulama. And, it, and this is basically what was the title of the slide. How did it do that? It did, it did that by, by getting basically, as you said, subjects, basically their own students who believe that it's from our own uh, skin and tongue. They brainwash them. They send them basically to the, 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 the effective and influential institutions, specifically Al-Azhar under Muhammad Ali. Uh, Muhammad Ali's era, uh, and he injected them into basically the, the, the educational curriculum through basically professorship and so forth, and that's how basically they trickled down their own understanding. Right now, in, in Al Azhar, right now, I, mean, I studied basically with Al Azhar scholars. Some of them, Alhamdulillah, are classical and traditionalist, the ones that have taught me. There is maybe one who basically, who basically could identify as, as a modernist, but he's a history teacher, I didn't take much from him. I'm very truthful, I can tell you the name, Alhamdulillah. I mean. And there's other basically, which is a modernist uh, slash, I don't want to call it basically every super like that, but there's a modernist movement within Al-Azhar which is in control. So, so that is the, 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 the 
the aim for the slides as, as well understood. But when we talk about Orientalism as a Muslim Ummah, we don't care basically about the effects upon others specifically as much relatively as we care about basically what happened to us. The Muslim Ummah for the last six, seven hundred years basically have been under the influence of this ori Orientalist movement, which basically is politically driven, is militarily driven, is economically driven through a whole continent. And in, 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 in this current day and age, basically not one continent, two continents, North America and Europe, and basically parts of, uh, of Asia, to make sure Islam as an ideology and the Muslim movement as, as, as a nation gets debunked and stay uh, on their knees. So for sure, basically, for a Muslim audience, and I'm a Shabi'a teacher myself, uh, half of the audience here are my students, I'm teaching basically the effects of Orientalism on the Muslimin. So for sure, basically, I, I tackled it, and I pinpointed basically the sources, and how the effect basically went through from the papers that were written in Europe, in their own libraries, in their own research centers, and how it actually trickled down to the Muslim mind, uh, step by step. I did not see basically a, a gap there, alhamdulillah. So barakallah, thank for your criticism. It's always good to, to, to share, to share the ideas, alhamdulillah. I'm very open for that. And you can ask my students about this, inshallah. If you have more criticism, I'm, I'm very well open, inshallah. After the Q&A, you can deliver all that openly or privately. Okay, inshallah. Okay. Question: the, bro the brother asked, "How uh, there are we? We read in some of the hadith, like in, uh, Ibn Jad'an, and we read other stories of kuffar from the Jahiliya period, who existed in that fatra period between Isa alayhi and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, who ended up going to hell despite not having any warders or messengers coming to them." I personally adopt opinion number three. And that opinion is the Ahlul Fatra. I didn't want to push any of my opinions upon, the, uh, upon you brothers and sisters today. I just want to share the opinions with you and everyone's free to adopt uh, the opinion that he wants to adopt. But the opinion that I adopt is opinion number three, which is that the Ahlul Fatra will be tested on the Day of Judgment. So the reconciliation is very easy for opinion number three. I would just simply say, he is going to be tested on the Day of Judgment, and he fails. That would simply be my response. Other scholars might say that certain people from amongst the period of Jahiliya had the message of Ibrahim السلام, reached to them. And that's why there were a few Hanifs that existed during the, the, the Jahiliya period, even though they were very little, and you could count them on your fingers. But the fact remains that some scholars were of the view that the message of Ibrahim السلام, reached some of those in the Jahiliya period, and that was sufficient uh, accountability for them. And uh, since they rejected that message, they would end up going to hell. 
So I personally adopt opinion number three. Those who adopt opinion number two, the, ma the, the majority of the Maturidi position, uh, they would say he's going to hell anyways because uh, Ahlul Fatra uh, are bound by their aql. As for opinion number one, I'll be interested to see what they would say in answer. So I won't speak on their behalf. Very well. Just again to add to this, uh, it's a little confusion here. Uh, the definition of basically al Fatra being the people between prophets, you're taking it too literally. Well, that actually the Fuqahat and the Mufassirin and the Usuliyin uh, mean, means basically when the message of the earlier prophet gets lost, and that basically means taken into account geographic nature, and before the next messenger comes in, this is al Fatra. We can't say basically between Isa and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that it's everybody that has it's, it's illogical. So when the Fuqaha speaks it, they're speaking it to uh, students of Arun who to understand what they're saying, or other scholars. So when the previous Prophet's message, Tandathiru, meaning basically gets lost, and the second Prophet does not come, in between, depends on geography, could be 10 years, could be 100 years, could be 500 years, those we call Muhammad So be, be aware of that, child. Number two. In terms of basically uh, your question about the uh, Orientalists, without a doubt, there are Orientalists who are balanced and, and, and their views basically are not uh, offensive to Islam. And I made sure in my presentation to not mention any of them on purpose. So, what I love people are actually doing it. I'm not here playing games, I'm here to basically come to propagate Islam. People who know me know me very well. Uh, if they basically are studying Islam, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them. That's all I can say. That's all the dua. Anyway, I'm legible to give them. But me, going to the non-Muslims, to study Islam, and to get indexes of the uh, hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's a shame on our ummah in this day and age. Okay? So you need to understand, uh, if they did hard work basically studying Islam, class, we keep it for you. And actually, I would advise them not to basically put too much effort and come to learn Islam from us. Not the other way around. You get it? So I hope you understand basically why I did not basically give them any credit because they don't deserve any credit from the Ummah of Islam. They can give themselves credit. That's fine. But I think it's better for them to come to us to learn Islam instead of doing their own research. Uh, and, and that's really my, my simple answer, uh, answer about this. The other thing, in terms of basically Rashid uh, al uh, I did not mention him on purpose because this was an introduction. When I explained it on course, I'd like to debate you in class too on, on, on this one. Uh, as you can see, I'm very comfortable and happy to always debate my students because I want them to be tough. I want them to basically be able to handle a discussion. Uh, actually, the, 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 the good scholars of, of, of today and the consensus of scholars of the past, like Imam Ahmad Rahimullah, and all the scholars over here, and tell me I'm saying there's a consensus. That there's a person who is Ahlul Bid, who has a bid'ah. Uh, that's not even bid'ah, basically bid'ah mukaffira, yani, like modernism, yeah? Or something a little bit slighter than that, the, the, the fatwa of that person basically becomes muharram for people to accept. So yes, all the tafasir that Muhammad Abdul wrote and all the literature he, he published, uh, in my view, and uh, this, is, this is what I'm saying, I'm giving you the full truth, is actually haram for the student of alim, for other than to refute him to study it and consume it. And the student of the, of the person is like the teacher, so he takes al fir'a and al he takes the same hukum. So even Tafsir al-Manar, I would not basically uh, tell people to read it, uh, unless, uh, until, uh, for refuting uh, what's in it. In terms of your last comment, basically there is some good in it. Uh, I'm sorry, basically, what came from the West can stay in the West. We do not need their goodness in interpreting our Quran and Sunnah, they will keep that, inshallah. I mean, uh, uh, I just want to give a chance to the sisters. Are there any sisters that have questions? Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll come back to the brothers, inshallah. Those who believe in Allah and Yawmul Akhirah 
as those who do good deeds, they shouldn't be uh, feared. While in uh, Surah Al Imran, ayah number 19, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says, in the Dina and the Lahi Islam, when we teach Islam to children, when such situation occurs, where in Quran we find uh, such ayahs, how should we deal with them? Because uh, one ayah is after the other. And uh, I come across such a situation, I want a real good on any classroom uh, usually. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the question, sister. So basically, we read a verse such as, Tura, uh, such as Surah 2, Ayah 62, which says that those who believe and those who were Jews or Christians or Sabians, who those who believe in Allah in the last day and do righteousness will have their reward with Allah. And then in another verse, we read that the only religion accepted, uh, acceptable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. So how do we reconcile between the two? Well, the, the, the way... I would prefer, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in teaching kids uh, Islam, uh, so it's not really uh, uh, my area, but what I would, uh, what I do intend in the future when I want to teach my kids Islam is that first I would like them to read the entire Quran. I believe this topic, I, I think it's sad. I th I'm happy to be with all you brothers and sisters, but I think it was sad that we needed to have a workshop on this topic today. I think it's very disappointing that I had to come here and actually read all those passages and had to refute all those arguments because this is the very heart of the message of Islam. And it's saddening to me to see that there are people coming and adopting this notion of religious pluralism. For me, I think that a child, an innocent child who reads the Quran will never have religious pluralism cross his mind because I think the verses that we all read together are very clear. Now, if there are some passages in which require some additional commentary upon them, there's no harm in explaining those passages to your child. So if the child asks, oh, well, why over here does it say that there are you know, Christians and Jews that might make it to heaven, just simply clarify the way we clarified uh, today in the discussion. Just say, you know, uh, this is referring to those true followers of Musa and of Isa They had true followers who followed their messages and they are going to make it to paradise as well. And it's as simple as that. It doesn't have to get any more complicated than that. It, it, in just a, a line or two, you could clarify that to them. And then when they grow up and they want to get more sophisticated, you can start talking about asbab and nuzul, what's the historical context of which this verse was revealed. And then you could give the narrations which talk about the, 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 the context of these verses. I mean, we didn't, I didn't want to talk about it today because I was trying to save time, but the historical context of this verse is that uh, uh, Salman al Farisi came and asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, well, what about uh, th those Christians uh, that would truly follow the teachings of, uh, of Isa alayhi salam? This passage came in response to what you said. So we didn't dive into the historical context of all these passages. Rather, most of them were quite clear in their apparent reading. And so we just suffice today with reading those passages. But I think if you feel that your child has any concerns or is struggling with understanding certain passages of the Qur'an, the number one thing that you need to do is not tell him to just shut up. <laughs> you need to tell him uh, to express his concerns and you need to address them for him. And if you're not able to, you could always, you yourself, go and ask a sheikh and the sheikh could give you the correct interpretation, and then you could communicate it to your child as well. 